we are um, on page 186. And the question that we had left off that was asked by the Khazar king last time was how do we understand the idea that the Torah presents us with that God in some way benefits from korbanot, that God gets some kind of benefit from sacrifices. It says, after all, reyach nichochi, that there's some kind of uh, uh, fragrance that God imbibes from the korbanos that in some way benefits him. And how does that, how can we reconcile that if we know that God is a transcendent God and, we, and he's completely above anything physical, how does he uh, in some way imbibe something and get benefit from something that's purely physical? We had seen, um, you know, we had given out a sheet last week um, that offers a few explanations based on the commentaries to the Pasuk where this idea of God smelling the fragrance of the sacrifice is first mentioned. And that's with the story of Noah coming off the teva. And uh, we're, we started rolling. Noah coming off the teva and uh, offering a carbon to Hashem from some of the animals that he brought off the ark with him. And God imbibing the fragrance and getting some kind of uh, hana'a, getting some kind of benefit. And through that benefit, God said that no longer would he ever uh, destroy man through a flood as he had done. And so we, like we saw a very strong language from the Ibn Ezra, who had told us, Chalila v'chalila, or v'chalila chalila liot Hashem meriach. God forbid that we can attribute um, smelling or imbibing fragrance to God. God does not smell, God does not eat, God does not consume. But rather, all it means is a borrowed term, according to the Ibn Ezra, that God in some way, saw what mankind had done and saw that there was redeeming value in man. God says, oh, I enjoy the behavior that mankind is demonstrating by bringing a korban. I see that Noah has brought redemption to the human, to the human condition, and therefore no longer will I ever destroy man out, uh, uh, entirely through a flood. And the Radak seems to say the same thing. Dibra Torah Kaloshin B'nai Adam V'derech Mashal he said that the Torah speaks metaphorically, the Torah speaks in a way that human beings can understand, but certainly God does not require this at all. We saw from the Rikanati that if you look at some of the more um, Kabbalistic sources, it seems that God is ascribed with certain um, qualities that parallel the human body. It's not that God in any way has a corporeal form, but just like the human being can be broken down to different organs, so too, according to the Zohar, God has different organs in a, on a spiritual plane, as it were, and whatever the carbon does um, on, a, on the physical plane, it has some kind of effect on the spiritual plane to in some way stimulate the organ of God's nostrils. In other words, his the nose that God has, so to, God has, so to speak, is in some way stimulated through the offering of a carbon. That for us was very difficult to understand, of course, because you know we normally don't think of God as having any any kind of um, of division. And this type of interpretation that we offered from the Rikanati, who's looking at Zoharic literature is anathema to some of the earlier Rishonim, like the Rambam. It's not clear what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is going to say about it. And finally, we looked at the Malbim, which is a, a 19th century commentary. And he says that the idea of reyach is related to ruchniyut, so that when you burn something, you're dividing its spiritual component from its physical. Every physical item in the world has a spiritual component. When you burn it, you strip out the spiritual components of it uh, from the physical, which become carbonized. And it was that spiritual component that ascends, as it were, to God. And the Malbim says that what this is supposed to do really is a psychological effect. It's supposed to show us that a person should imagine himself offering himself up to God. And that's what gives God pleasure, is the uh, effect not that it has on Hashem, but that it has on the bringer of the carbon. So the Malbim offers a much more modern approach, a, a psychological approach, 
a, a reflexive approach of what sort of what we say all prayer is supposed to do to a person is supposed to influence the person offering the worship, offering the gift up to Hashem. So these are all different perspectives of the way that we try to understand what it means for God to imbibe the fragrance. Yes, Linda. So I don't really want to sound like a heretic or anything, but... But. <laughs> I, I just, I have to tell you that I really always had a problem with the sacrifices because I find it very primitive. And when you compare it to a lot of the um, pagans, like pagan rituals, it sort of reminds me of that because, yeah, I mean, sometimes they sacrifice people, but it, it just, I don't know, there's just like, I think so much else of the Torah is based on morality and ethics and spirituality from an intellectual perspective. Why? Is there so much emphasis on the Corbanot, which is so, I just find it almost primitive. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, 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 I validate your question. Um, I think you'd be satisfied with the approach of the Rambam, um, who says uh, that um, the emphasis on Corbanot in the Torah was a concession to a specific uh, time and place. And because Hashem saw that the world was worshiping their, their pagan gods using sacrificial worship, Hashem, in a, in a concession to the Jewish people who needed to feel that sense of a visceral, physical sense of um, tangible worship, granted Karbanos an elevated status in worship. Really, Karbanos should not have such an elevated status as to be such a central part of Jewish practice. The reason it did is because of the, uh, of the need of the people at that time in history to be able to bring sacrifices. The Rambam was problematic for a number of reasons in the way that he approaches this idea. But I just wanted to present this to you and that you should understand that you're not the first person to be bothered by the apparent primitiveness of this practice. The Rambam would agree. He would say, Indeed, it is primitive. Indeed, it is not something that is so important to Hashem. But because you're dealing with a, a world that is primitive, and it is a, a, an ancient world, and that's their way of worshiping their gods, that's why Hashem presented it to the Jewish people. Now, some of the problems with the Rambam are that it seems that for the Rambam, there is no, or there's very little inherent value in the Karbanos other than to be able to present the Jewish people with a need of theirs. So is that true? Well, it may or may not be. There's different ways. There's an important commentary of the Ritva who tries to mitigate the explanation of the Rambam. Um, maybe we'll take a look at that. Maybe that's worthwhile examining next week. But I think, I think it is important to point out that a lot of mitzvahs are concessions to the human condition. In other words, why do we need mitzvahs at all? For, from the Rambam standpoint, most mitzvahs that we do physically are there to enhance our intellect. So God tells us, do a physical act in order to create an impression that will be lasting upon your mind so that your mind will be have, you'll have a perfected intellect and through that perfected intellect you'll become closer to Hashem. That is the Rambam's consistent worldview of mitzvot. His worldview of mitzvot is God gave us physical commandments so that we could create a viable and lasting impression upon our intellects. And the more perfected the intellect, the closer we are to the Ribbon Shalom. Okay? Now, with that being said, the Rambam is unique in his emphasis in that regard. And I shouldn't say unique, but he's part of a certain rational school that not everyone subscribes to. You see very clearly from the Rikanati that we saw yes last week that from a Kabbalistic point of view there is an effect that the Karbanot are having upon God in some profound um, supernatural way that we don't fully understand. But from the Rambam standpoint the objective of the Karbanot is fulfilled in order to help us and the Ramban says this to a certain extent as well, in order to create an impression upon us and create this image in our minds of the service of what it means to serve Hashem. That is the way that people were able to associate themselves to God in the ancient world. 
Uh, and it's not as important to modern man from the Rambam's point of view. Now, what, are we, what is the Rambam going to do with the fact that in all of our prayers, we ask for a return to the sacrificial order? If this is not something that's so important to modern man, then why should we want, it, want to regain it and to recover it? So that's a question that we'll have to put on the side for now. Maybe we'll revisit it next time. But I just wanted to point out that your question has validity, and, and to, so much so that the Rambam says that Carbonos is a concession. Yes? Well, I mean, I was going to say that we say in all our so in fact, when you dive in with stuff, you read about all the, the moth tears, all about the Carbonos that we put yeah, in that particular. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about something you said at the end of the class last week. I think you said um, that the smoke going up from the crematoria was a reach Michoach Lashem. Yeah, probably it was. Yeah. That's why that's why I would like to imagine it. Yeah. So I can't think that. I picture Hashem crying when that's happening. And when you say a reach Michoach, it sounds like it's pleasant for him. And I feel like he's so distressed by this, how could it be a reach Michoach? Hmm. That's a it's a good point. Um, I, this is the way I imagine it. You have a right to imagine it in your way. I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction. Obviously, God is is in mourning any time Jews are, are murdered. Um, but I but I also feel that there's in some way there's some rectification that took place through the mass murder of uh, six million Jews. I don't know what the rectification was. I have no idea what it was. But I can only imagine that whatever rectification took place allowed Hashem to re, uh, resume his divine plan. And in that respect, I meant to say that it's a reich nichoch. Not that God isn't sad about it. We do ascribe e human emotion to the Ribbon Shalom, just like we ascribe God being pleased with the uh, fragrance of a carbon, even though that's a borrowed term. We also ascribe great grief to Hashem whenever uh, uh, righteous people are killed. But I don't think it's a contradiction. I think that uh, we mourn just like Hashem mourned over the deaths of the righteous, and but we also understand that there's part of this is part of a divine plan. I mean, you can think about it also. I mean, should God be happy that an animal is being killed? Well, if it's fulfilling its purpose and ex its existence, so then in a sense, yeah. I mean, in a sense, yes. Obviously, you can't compare animals to human beings, but it's everything is a creation of God. So when any creation of Hashem is destroyed, uh, it's, there's a certain sadness for its destruction. But it, within that sadness also comes the satisfaction that it's fulfilling its purpose in some way. So six million Jews died for a purpose. I don't know what the purpose is, but the only way that I can uh, derive consolation from the six million who died, including you know, my own grandparents, is to say that they died for, for a purpose. So that's what I meant to say with the uh, Freyach Michalach. Yes? Um, if God loves all creatures, why can't he bring a sacrifice with a blemish? That's also a good question. And um, for the Rambam, the answer would be, is that in order to be able to demonstrate proper service of God, you have to show uh, respect and take that which is the most pristine of your items in the service of God. That's the way you would serve a king like the Gemara itself says, "Hakriveu um, nalefecha secha," is I think is the language of the pasuk. The Gemara quotes this pasuk says, "Would you offer such a creature to the mayor of your town?" Um, meaning is that uh, God doesn't. If if you truly respect God and the worship that you're showing to God is a, a sign of great respect and honor that you're trying to bestow upon God, you would not take a creature that is blemished in order to show your subservience and worship to that to that higher deity. But aren't we all blemished in some way? Of course, of course. So that's why we have to be as selective as possible. Like, like yes, it's true, we're all blemished, but at the same time, when we want to show that we honor something, we don't, sh we don't, you know, when you want to when you want to give your sweetheart flowers, you don't give her weeds because we're all blemished. You know, she's just going to slam the door in your face, right? So, uh, so you have to, to choose something that's the nicest, the choicest of what you have available to you, right? 
Patricia, yeah. <coughs> this is really uh, almost a footnote, but in a lot, I think somewhere in the 1970s or 1980s, there was a chief rabbi in Haifa, whose name I can't remember now, who held that at the time of the third temple, when the Shia comes, all the korbanot will be plant-based, and we will all be well, we will all be vegetarian again. I'm and not sure. I'm not sure plant. if you're quoting Rabbi Simcha Cook, who was the chief rabbi of Rechavot, uh, or if you're quoting uh, Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Hakohen Cook, who lived much earlier than the 70s or 80s, who is ascribed with that statement that all korbanos will be sorry, vegetable. I had the date wrong. It was the, the, the second one, but I had the right. date wrong. I read about him, I guess. Okay, <laughs> right. So it's. Um, he is ascribed with saying that, but uh, there's a lot more emphasis that's placed on that by animal rights people than really what he actually said. <laughs> because um, the truth of the matter is, is that it's very hard to understand. Rabbi Cook wrote very cryptically, and um, a lot of his things that he wrote were meant as metaphor. And so it's not at all clear whether he was writing in a halachic um, format when he made those when he made that very terse statement that in my opinion, is just, and a lot of people's opinions, just blown out of proportion. Did Rav, does Rav, Cook, did Rav Cook know what exactly was going to happen in the third base? I mean, there's no, none of us know what's going to happen. But we are told that in some way there will be a, a return to the sacrificial order. I mean, this is a much larger question, which is, what do you do with, all, oh, I just saw the most amazing video on Facebook last night before I went to bed. And it was out of Australia about how people are training cows to be like pets and they do tricks and think about this the next time you want to eat a cow or something. I mean, that was, the, it was like a, a one and a half minute video. I mean, cows are very intelligent animals. They are. And they're capable of doing very interesting things because they do have some level of intelligence. And of course, that's the appeal. To not eat, uh, to not eat uh, meat, to not eat animals, and I, I have, I confess that there is a certain uh, appeal to that argument. Cruelty to animals. We are told by our sages that an animal does feel pain when it is being slaughtered. We minimize the pain when we slaughter the animal to avoid uh, prolonged pain. But there's no way. The only animal that does not feel pain, according to the sages, when you kill it, is a fish. Fish do not feel pain when they die, and that's why there's no obligation to kill a fish straight out right away. You can let it, you know, flap around on the deck of the boat until it expires from suffocation because it doesn't feel pain. But <clears throat> the contrast is, is that all mammals do feel pain when they, when they die and when they are killed, but you just do whatever you can to minimize the pain by slaughtering them with a very, very sharp knife without any... Um, defects on it so that it won't feel the pain of the shechita as much as if you used another method. So how do we reconcile that? I mean, the, there's a prohibition of tsar balechaim. God doesn't want us to inflict wanton, you know, a gratuitous pain on an animal. And the answer is, is that Hashem said, I created certain animals for that purpose. They were created for that very purpose of allowing the human being to be able to elevate himself in some way by providing himself with nutrition. And, uh, and if this is what a Jew, or any human being for that matter, can use in, in to be able to grow and to be able to be productive as a human being, so then it's, it's justified. Justified to take a lesser organism and to ingest it in order to be able to achieve the purpose of the human being. Because whereas some animal rights experts, you know, the extremists in PETA, will tell you that there really is no difference between one organism and another. We're all creatures, we're all, um, we're all animals in that sense. There's no difference between a baby who can't speak and a chimpanzee who can't speak, right? They're all the same. So then it's true that uh, you know, there's no justification for one organism to take the life of another organism for survival. But we see that that's not the will of Hashem. We see that Hashem created, even in the animal kingdom, that God creates predators and God creates animals who are the prey of those predators, and that's part of the natural order. And the same thing is true with human beings. God created human beings as, um, as omnivores with an appetite for meat. He specifically tells Noah that you have a right to eat uh, meat because uh, you have mastery over the animal kingdom. And therefore, under certain circumscribed conditions, under certain limitations, 
a Jew is allowed to consume meat, assuming that the animal is slaughtered properly, it's the, right, it's the right species, he doesn't consume the blood, and so forth and so on. But there were some very great rabbis, not only from the past century, but even earlier than that, who felt that they wanted to be able to go higher than the Torah's permission and abstain from uh, eating animals because they felt that they would feel, in a sense, holier if they could go back to the time when we were as close as we can to the time when we were Adam and Chava in Gan Eden, at which time we didn't eat, uh, we didn't eat meat. The permission to eat meat was only given to, to Noah. It's a much lengthier discussion. I'm not sure how much we want to dwell on this point can today or not. Me? Yes, but I'm not sure. ask you about the, the spiritual parts that an animal have. What kind of spiritual parts do they have? Every living organism has something called a ruach. Mm. Every, every living organism has a ruach. It doesn't have a neshama, right but it has a ruach chayim. Right, only, yeah. only the human being has what's called a neshama. Mm -hmm. But there's a spiritual force, an animating force, that exists within every living organism. To a certain degree, even plants have a, a, a spiritual component to them. Uh, yeah, and it gets even more interesting when you study Kabbalah and you see that there's even there could even be um, certain aspects of of Gilgul Nishamot. There could be reincarnation uh, within lower organisms uh, as well. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to say there's so many subtle nuances though. Yesterday I put on a new pair of shoes to wear to show, and I was going to make a shachianu. And then my husband said, are they leather? I said, yes, of course they're leather. <laughs> he said, so you don't make a shachianu on leather shoes because an animal had to, you know, give its life so you could have those shoes. You don't make a shachianu no. ever on shoes. <laughs> no. Never, ma never make a shachianu. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and the reason is not because an animal gave its life. Because if that were the if that were the law, then you should not make a shechiano on a new fur coat that costs ten thousand dollars. But we know I've that never that's, had that experience. Yes, well, I give you a bracha that you should be so blessed. Um, but the halacha is that you do make a shechiano on a new fur coat. Um, I, I'm not an advocate of fur coats, by the way. I mean, I think that that may that may verge on a gratuitous the use of an animal, unless you're using the animal for meat anyway, and then you have the ability to use its fur. Then it's not gratuitous, because you've got the fur anyway. So why uh, do you make a shechianu on any shoes? You don't make a shechianu on shoes because they're considered to be a necessity. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not a pleasure to get shoes. I mean, unless you're a Mel DeMarcos, or, <laughs> and you have a closet full of shoes. <laughs> shoes are a necessity. And that's why you don't make a shechianu. Well, a suit? A suit is not a necessity? No, a suit is, a suit is not a necessity. You can wear jeans and a shirt. A suit is something that is, that is kavadik, that it provides a person with additional glory above and beyond the basic staple. That's why you don't make a shechianu on a shirt. You don't make a shechianu on, on underwear. You only make a shechianu on a chash of a garment. Shoes are not considered to be chash of no matter how much you paid for them because they're a basic necessity. If the person has to sell everything that he owns in order to get a pair of shoes, according to the Gemara, because you need it. And not only that, but shoes are also a reflection of the frailty of the human condition. So it's almost a, a busha when we put on a pair of shoes because no other animal in the animal kingdom has to wear shoes except human beings. So it's, it's demonstrative of the fact that we are weaker and more frail because of our own shortcomings in the physical world than uh, the rest of the animal kingdom. Okay, where, where are we here? I, I've lost my bearings. Okay. Yeah. What is the connection about shoes? And Bill, the person away, we throw out the shoes. What is the connection about it? So the taking off of shoes is a sign of mourning. It's a sign of mourning because we're, we're demonstrating that we are making ourselves completely vulnerable, completely throwing away any sense of care of our own welfare, which is why we tear our clothes, we don't groom ourselves, and we take off our shoes to show. <laughs> Well, that we're throwing away the shoes of the Elifidah. Ah, okay. So there's, there's a concept that one should not benefit from the effects of a dead person. So that's, that's I believe that's the reason. That's not clothing, it's different. Clothing is different, yeah. 
I think that's more based on Kabbalah, though I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so where are we? So we're talking about the Karbanot. We're talking about um, whether or not Karbanot are something that's a concession to the ancient world, the primitive worldview, or whether there's something intrinsically of value to them. Um, the Ramban, in, in contrast to the Ramban, says there's always something intrinsically valuable about Karbanot. And if a person is willing to kill an animal in order to be able to use it for the prosaic benefit of food, then surely a person should be prepared to kill an animal in order to be able to achieve some kind of spiritual benefit. I eat meat all the time in order to be able to get a purely physical benefit from the meat, so why should I not uh, kill an animal in order to be able to garner spiritual benefit from the animal? So if anything, if a person looks at the bringing of a carbon as a gratuitous killing of an animal, then that person is not appreciating the benefit that is obtained through the offering of a carbon. Because if you look at that as gratuitous, then what right do you have to slaughter an animal for, for food? Okay, now I want to, this is all by way of introduction to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's perspective. He takes a worldview that is very, very different, and it, it goes back to a theme that we have seen in Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, that the purpose of mitzvot is not like the Rambam says, to enhance the intellect. The purpose of doing a mitzvah is not so that by engaging in certain physical activities, I'll be able to influence the way I think so that I'm going to become a more perfected human being up here and therefore become closer to Hashem. That's not at all what the mitzvot are all about. For Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, the mitzvot have a magic to them. And it's once again important for us to define the word magic. Some people have this negative uh, um, connotation when they hear the word magic. They think it's either something primitive or something that's hocus pocus, and it implies uh, something fake, something an illusion, or some kind of old world kind of thing that has no bearing on reality. Uh, and if it does, it must be like black magic. No, the word magic in its most stripped down sense, and the way that it's used in an academic sense, the word magic simply means that there's a certain way to utilize the physical world in order to be able to achieve a supernatural effect. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is a big advocate of this kind of magic that exists within Jewish ritual. That when we do certain things in a certain prescribed way, we are able to create inherent changes on a supernatural plane. And we gave this analogy some time ago when we talked about the shaking of a lulav in an esro. And we mentioned that if a person were to take a lulav and a lemon and try to shake it, would you fulfill the mitzvah? The answer is no. It would be a lot less expensive because a lemon is 49 cents and an estrog is $49 or, I don't know, $490, whatever it is. But you're still not fulfilling the mitzvah. Now, why are you not fulfilling the mitzvah? For the Rambam, you're not fulfilling the mitzvah because you did not simply did not do it in the prescribed way. You're not conforming to the rules. But is there any reason why a lulav is a an esrog is inherently any better than a lemon? No. It seems from the Rambam there's nothing inherently better or more effective uh, to an esrog over a lemon. If you do, if you shake it and you have the right thoughts, and you do the motions, and you surround yourself with the agriculture of Eretz Yisrael, and you can achieve the same intellectual benefit, then you've achieved the real objective of the mitzvah, regardless of whether you used an esrog or a lemon. You haven't conformed to the protocol, and therefore you're not credited with the performance of the mitzvah. But for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, it's much more profound than that. When you shake a, a lemon instead of an esrog, the lemon simply lacks on a spiritual plane that kind of whatever wavelength an esrog transmits throughout the cosmos, this lemon doesn't have. So it's just like the medicine analogy that Rabbi Yudha had given long way back in the first essay, where he said that if you take a medication that looks exactly like the pill that the doctor has prescribed for you, but it doesn't have the same chemical makeup, 
it could end up doing much more damage than good. And if anything, it won't, it'll simply do nothing to you. If you take a blood pressure medication for your diabetes, it's going to do nothing. It's not going to help your diabetes, right? And in the same way, if you take a lemon instead of an esrog, the esrog has within it innate qualities which we don't understand, which we haven't, it hasn't been explained to us exactly how it interacts with the supernatural world, but it does in some way bring down some kind of spiritual benefit to either the individual or to the Jewish community or to the entire world. And that's why Hashem wants you to do it in that prescribed way. If you, if you change even one detail, then it's like changing like one little my item, one little, um, you know, um, in the, one little thing in the chemical diagram, and it changes the whole nature of the compound, and it doesn't work anymore. In the same way, Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi takes the approach to Karbanot. And he says that the purpose of Karbanos, it has a magic effect on the way that God interacts with the Jewish people. His view is that the reason why Hashem told us to bring Karbanos is to fulfill the objective that the Torah says would happen when we build a Mishkan for Hashem. The Asuli Mikdash V'Shachanti V'Socham that when you make a mishkan for me, when you make a holy place, I will dwell in your midst. But it's not just building the edifice, you also have to do the protocol inside that edifice, the whole purpose of why the edifice was constructed in the first place. What's the protocol that has to be performed in order to bring the Shekhinah down to the Jewish people? It's the Ma'asei HaKarbanos, it's the performance of the Karbanos. And therefore, you need to perform karbonos in a certain prescribed way in order for God's divine presence to come down. God, as it were, circumscribed himself to a certain set of rules that have to do with physical nature and metaphysics that says that I will only bring my divine presence into your midst if you perform certain prescribed acts. No matter how much you love me, no matter how much I love you, if you don't perform those prescribed acts, then my Shekhinah will not descend into the people. And that's the purpose of Karbanos, and that, he says, as we're going to see shortly, is what is meant by Reach Nicholchi, Reach, as Korbani Lachmi Li'ishai, Reach Nicholchi Tishmir Lakri Li'bumo That this is my bread, this is my fire. And it is the, the ingredient that is necessary in order for me to be able to deposit my shechina down in this earth. By doing this, you create the necessary physical conditions or concessions, however you want to look at it, that God requires in order for his shechina to dwell in our midst.